थ्री एक्शन so do you ever get scared of starting something and if so how do you overcome the fear um i i i'd say that i don't get scared of necessarily starting things but i get scared of uh the effect that starting things will have on my responsibilities okay. so i i've certain responsibilities to my cats and my family and whatever yeah. and you know i don't i don't want to you know put them at risk so to speak i'm fine taking risks i don't want i don't want my actions to affect those around me oh, negatively wow. so to speak so that that's the only time something would would come as a fear Sure. But, uh, and has that has, has that happened in the past? Um, I, I I took a long think before I started Polygod, you know, because I I got offered a job out of Varsity and it was quite well paying, and I thought I could do this, earn a bit of money, and then start it myself, or I could take the risk because I have the idea now, and you know, grab life by the horns. So I thought, do that. Nice, yeah. yeah. A, a head start is. I hope you're listening to this. Yeah, this makes r- sense. Risk it for the biscuit. Hey, nice. So so what is your take on failure? I lo- I love failure. I think that people should fail more often and that failure is great because failure stings and you remember it. And when you remember something, you can learn from it. If you win, you, you're not going to remember 100 wins in a row, but you can remember mm. that one loss that knocked your ego down a peg and you can learn something from that loss. And if you don't learn something, maybe you'll lose more, but if you do, you could actually correct it to win more. And I think that's that's the beauty of failure. It's a real opportunity. That You said it so well because most people our age they see failure as bad. Obviously because the school system or I don't know what yeah. it is. So let's go back to Polygod. What was the tipping point for you to like just take action and go do it? I'd say the tipping point was when I went for my interview with the people who were offering me the oh. job and uh, I was talking to them and they said uh, all code that I write not during office hours as in code that I write at home will belong to them during my period of employment. And I thought to myself, I do so much extra work at home. Yeah. There's no way in hell <laughs> I'm giving people my IP. Yeah. Like, nah, it's more worth it to do it myself. Yeah. Is that for like all game companies? Or I I don't know. It must maybe it was just their co- their contract, maybe it's all game com- companies. I don't do that to win. <laughs> you can write as much code as you want at home. Nice. Okay, so now this is that's so now we getting to the meaty part. So tell us the detailed action steps that you took to take your idea into reality. So um with with taking Polygon to a reality the first thing that I did was I made the prototypes. I got on and I made the game. I made a basic version of the game, not the whole thing. I made the first level, I made the first couple of enemies. I didn't do the first boss yet. I made the first weapon and maybe the first three power-ups. Just enough that I could show an investor something. Ideas are great, but you need to have something to show an investor. Yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be the final product, but it has to show that you know what you're doing and you know uh that and you can show that you can do something with it. So, I built these prototypes, uh took these to stuff and showed him, let him play them. He he loved the game. He thought it was a lot of fun. And uh since then we've just been uh working on the game more, uh improving it and then eventually we got to a point where we were like, okay, I cut up a trailer. We filmed I think 5 hours of footage and then cut it up into a minute 30. Sure. And so we got some amazing cuts there and then we made this trailer and then we launched the trailer. We got 13,000 hits on that. Oh wow. And then uh we launched our Steam Greenlight campaign where we needed to get enough votes to get into Steam. And I remember uh, Pixel Boy took us hundreds of days to get. It was incredibly challenging. So we were prepared for that. And then it took us 2 weeks with sure. Polygod and then we got greenlit so then Now we're going to be on Steam and we actually are on Steam or in Steam early access you can get us now while we're still deving the game and yeah great and so tell me how long did it take to make those initial mockups you know what you uh, showed to your investor uh so i i tend to do prototyping quite fast the polygod prototypes were using old technology that i'd already built upon so the old tech took maybe 3 months to make sure. but that wasn't being made specifically for polygod i was just making that in my spare time out of curiosity and for other projects and then w- the actual dev from taking that tech to having a, a usable game was about a week and then uh, that prototype was then shot so I'd, i say don't spend a huge amount of time on it yeah. you know give it a week solid week of hard work and you can you can usually show someone something really cool with that wow. could you tell me like your process of coding the game like how would you structure it in your head and then actually do it I can show you. Yeah. You know, show so. me but for the people listening through the podcast and yeah. describe. Okay, I'll describe it. So This is cool. So the way it works is it's basically a bunch of folders and uh the folders have names and inside one of the folders is called scripts. Okay. Uh is a bunch of C# sharp files um and those files are code. And what those 
code files do is at the beginning when your game starts it runs a main file and that file tells a whole bunch of other files to do a whole bunch of other things and then those files tell a whole bunch of other files to do a whole bunch of other things and that little chain of events keeps happening and uh, I've got about a couple hundred scripts here. Wow, how many lines of code is that? So the scripts vary in lines of code by yeah. quite a lot. Um, I'll open one here. Um, so for example, this just controls uh, moving the character in the game. And it is, I think, Whoa. 1,600 lines of code. And that's one script. Yeah, this is one of like 600 scripts and this one just handles moving the player around. Whoa taking damage from enemies, shooting, dealing with the power-ups, yeah. all, all that sort of stuff. So each script obviously is for one aspect of the game or a few aspects of the game. Yeah, and so I, I try to make the scripts as modular as possible because then I can use them in future games. So right now we have a basic shooting script, so if we make a new game we can use that script in other places. Oh, cool. And yeah, so try to, try to reuse as much code as possible. That's clever. And then obviously that's going to save you so much time, so everything you're going to make now can help you in the future. Yeah. And then obviously if you want to start another game, it'll be much quicker. Oh, exactly. So maybe... I mean, a lot of the technology that we've developed uniquely to solve problems oh, in Polygod have opened a lot of opportunities for new games. And oh. th that's really the funnest part because all these new opportunities are very inspiring. I'm like, oh, cool, I want to make a game like this, and yes. I want to do this, and ooh, this can be used here like that. So, so nice. it's, it's very fun. It's, it, I think it's nice to be at the beginning stage of a game yes. studio because we're making all the tools that we're going to end up using. So mistakes are part of the process. What were the mistakes that you made along the way? And could you share us the experience that you learned from that? Um, I, I still make mistakes. I mean, every week I'm getting feedback from, from our users telling us to fix some bugs. You know, the, the beauty of early access is that you're buying the game as a work in progress. So there are bugs, there are mistakes. But if you find those mistakes and you report them, I'll fix them. Mm. So it's not, it's not final. So every time a mistake gets fixed, anyone who bought the game at an earlier stage is getting a better product for free. Oh, so that's, that's, that's a nice bonus of early access. Cool. What are your best productivity hacks? And how, what do you do to try to optimize your time? Yeah, I said don't travel. And this is why the interview is having here. <laughs> no, work, work, work smart, not hard. You know, I think one of the biggest things I learned, and this was specifically from Cape Town's traffic and commuting, is that it's just, it's not worth it a lot of the time, especially with our generation. So, I mean, I, I worked out going to lectures because my lectures were, I think, two hours apart. Yeah. I, would go, I would travel 45 minutes to go to, 15, to go to a 45 minute lecture, but I'd wait 15 minutes, so it would take a full hour. And in the lecture, I'd only get about five minutes of useful information. And then I'd have to wait two more hours to listen to another hour lecture for another five minutes of information. So I'm spending five and a half hours to get 10 minutes of information when I can just Google it and use the rest of the time on my startup. So yeah, just maximize your time and don't listen to society. Sure. Yeah. And I remember yo, when we spoke like two years ago, I remember you were telling me about, you know how to get do well in marks. It was like five hours, get a 60, seven hours, whatever. Oh yeah. yeah. When, when it comes to marks at Varsity, the first thing is employers don't check marks. They check, did you pass? And uh, what have you done? And then when it comes to marks, the amount of extra effort you need to put in to get a higher mark is exponential. It's yeah. like five hours for 60, seven for a 70, 10, 11 for an 80, it's 20 hours for a 90, and it's 100 hours for 100%. It's ridiculous. Sure, makes sense. So what are some of the opportunities in the gaming sector that you're excited about? Right now, I'd say the most exciting one is virtual reality. This has really been expanding in gaming really rapidly recently. Uh, we recently got our, heads, our hands on uh, Oculus SDK. So oh, we're gonna nice. Maybe do some stuff, maybe not, you'll see. So if, if someone wanted to start in the gaming space, what advice would you give to them? I would say go check out online tutorials, download Unity and start trying to make things immediately. It doesn't matter if it's not fun or if it's bad or if it's buggy, just make things because eventually you'll make something that's kind of cool and if you can show that to an employer, that's great. Yeah. In terms of online tutorials, like what are the kinds of things people should like start searching for? Uh, for gaming, I'd say specifically Unity tutorials, the basics. So how, how do you try to minimize risk and maximize success? So this is actually uh, comes towards the philosophy of our company. We do something called low fidelity design, which is okay. a pr principle of Japanese games design, okay. where you try to use as much of your resources as possible to minimize graphic costs and stuff. So 
for example, with Polygod, in order to make the game cheaper, we chose a specific art style that was easy for us to do within the constraints that we had, that wasn't hyperrealism, for example, and the art style still looks good. So the idea of, of low fidelity design is that you're not ever compromising the um, end product, but what you're doing is you're rethinking some industry standards in order to lower costs. And we managed to make this game for probably 5% of what it should have cost. Oh, wow. So like you pulled a SpaceX but for games. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a complete rethink. It was, uh, sure. we, we actually went all the way back to analyzing games from the 80s and how they did it. Wow. Because of how much technology has oh. influenced the design process. The, the modern design process is so different from that, the old 80s design process and that was really when games were starting yeah. so we went back and looked at that and used our knowledge now of the modern process and then optimized backwards so could you give an example of how you optimize it um, well one of the big examples is that all of our graphics is within a surrealist art style okay. so because of this we can produce the graphics at a much faster rate than we would do hyper realism yeah. but in terms of player satisfaction the whether it's a surrealist art style or a realist art style it's the same to a player as long as the art style is internally consistent. So as long as our art style doesn't look like there's something wrong with it, yeah. it'll still look beautiful. Oh. But it ends up being that a surrealist art style is significantly cheaper from a graphics perspective sure. than a realist one. So all your game designers, they should stick to surrealist. Yeah, I mean, until it gets more expensive, <laughs> you know, the costs are always wavering. Hey Head Starter, I really hope you took something valuable from that episode. Check out my other episodes where I interview other successful and inspiring young people in the world. I'll see you next time. Unless you don't subscribe. Oh, subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs>